in Paris, and she will talk about protocols to control COVID-19 transmission within schools. Perfect. Thank you, Diana. Sorry, and please. thanks, uh, the organizer, for this lovely invitation. But most importantly, thanks really for organizing the workshop because I think it was a right, it was the perfect moment to to go back in time and and have uh, uh, let's say an insight of what happened and how we can move forward. So um, before moving uh, in the specific of the studies that we made on transmission within school, I just wanted to give uh, an idea of what was the situation in France. So here I'm I'm, I'm showing the epidemic trajectory in terms of daily hospital admission through time um, we uh, we we were uh, we had a three lockdowns so one during the first very first wave in spring uh, 2020 one in the fall uh, of 2020 and then a third one during the spring of 2021 uh, schools were closed during the first lockdown but when lockdown ended the schools were reopened um, and this was uh, were not quite common at the time in in many european countries and since then mostly they have never been closed except for an anticipation of school holidays that coincided with the third with the lockdown of the third wave and so authorities in order to uh, put some more stringent conditions decided to anticipate to these uh, school holidays of one to two weeks depending on the school grades and all of the in, in the rest of the time uh, schools were kept open this was made really as a primary objective of the french government you know the, the, the fact of having uh, schools open as much as possible and indeed if we then go back and see about the statistics of the weeks of closure whether full or partial so for certain grades france was indeed among the countries in europe with the lowest number of weeks lost here i've put also the uk as a frame of reference um so the the study when we started thinking about this it was the summer of 2020 and of course thinking about the reopening of schools in september and then the uh, uh, expected uh, uh, fall and winter way we wanted to study better the transmission within school and of course we had very limited data so one of the the, the biggest obstacle was really to estimate transmission within the school and then once we had this estimate according to different conditions that have clearly evolved very rapidly over time because of the parents because of vaccination we wanted to look at uh, uh, possible protocols in order to reduce transmission but also accounting for other factors like for example minimizing the school closure and also optimizing the resources um, we use it for, for this work we used empirical contact data that were collected in a pre-pandemic period through RFID sensors that measure proximity face-to-face -face data. This is a collaboration with a, a project called the Sociopatterns that, that has a long-standing um, it's a long-standing project with a lot of different uh, data sets available and we use data sets for primary school including I mean, more than 200 students and different classes and then um, we use as a proxy for high school a data set coming from class preparatoire which are um, the last two years of high school so which are specific to the french schooling system in order to prepare to the Grand École, so to, to specific uh, university entry exams. So we use those uh, uh, different school settings in which you can see, for example, each individual is a little point. There is a clear community structure around the classes. Um, and then there is also quite a lot of exchange across the different classes, depending on on the setting and indeed if we look a little bit more in detail we can see that in primary school contacts within the class almost reach the the the, the full network so the the total number the total size of the class while instead in the secondary school this is much lower compared to the average class size uh, in the primary school there is also a lot of contacts between classes uh, but if we look at the time that is spent uh, during this context we see that the largest majority is within the class compared to between classes and similarly we, we see that also in the secondary schools also we looked at teacher student uh, contacts and we saw that teachers uh, spent less time in contacts compared to students and this is some in both in both settings and this is something that was observed uh, in france in the both settings but we have uh, 
also reports from, uh, for example, schools in other parts, uh, in other countries in Europe where this may not be the case. Then we use a very simple transmission model um, and the classic, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, type of disease progression that includes a uh, uh, prodromic phase where people will infect an individual can transmit the disease unobserved, and then a subdivision into clinical, subclinical um, phases, uh, and then before becoming immune. We consider some age specific uh, susceptibility probability of clinical uh, or developing clinical symptoms. Uh, um, all of that was informed by, uh, by of course, uh, evidence from and estimates from the literature and then updated uh, over time. Uh, we also considered the lower detection rate uh, uh, for clinical cases in children compared to adults because there were a few papers already showing very early in the pandemic that that because of uh, uh, non-specific symptoms, it was even harder to recognize uh, clinical cases in children. Um, we included tests and CDVD over time, specific to test type, we used PCR, um, Massopharyngeal tests, the saliva samples. So we use also uh, lateral flow tests, and of course the the, the use of, of of this test, even in that case, the policies evolved over time. Um, this test and CDV, according to estimates in the literature, were available. Uh, were also specific to age, whether children, adults, and were also specific to clinical and subclinical. And then, of course, there is the, the, the pattern of context that, that I showed before. So they're age-specific age in terms of number, in terms of duration, in terms of preference of re-establishing contacts with the same person over time because of friendships, for example. And of course, and they were also time varying. Um, and then all the, 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 the dual time distributions for these disease stages were, uh, even in that case, variant specific and obtained from the literature. Um, we so the first uh, the first thing that that we tried to estimate was uh, um, the within school uh, transmission and our model is, is really focuses having this detail high resolution of the contacts really focuses on this prototypical schools that we looked at, uh, primary and secondary schools, um, uh, and, and, and considers, uh, let's say, the coupling with the uh, external communities considered through importations. We looked at, uh, uh, we had very limited data, but a similar point to what happened is that during the alpha wave in the spring of 2021, um, some screenings were offered on a totally um, uh, voluntary participation in schools uh, in three departments of the Auvergne Rhône Alpes region, that is the region of Lyon. Um, and this and this was because there was clearly a wave that was uh, uh, increasing. And so local school authorities decided to implement and offer these uh, screenings uh, in an effort to, to already estimate the prevalence in the schools and then also try to understand what was the type of adherence that was measured. Uh, so here I'm showing you with the with this uh, dashed line, this is the weekly incidence. Um, and the histograms represent the number of schools that were testing. So um, this started four weeks before then lockdown was applied. But actually, the first two weeks, a very few schools participated. And so we have basically two weeks of data in the rising wave. Um, then this is the period of the lockdown and during which uh, schools were closed in anticipation of the Easter holidays. And then secondary schools were closed for one additional week uh, after the holidays. Um, the larger majority of schools that participated were primary school. And we have instead very little data on high school. So what we did was to uh, uh, build an inference framework uh, with our model, looking at the three departments uh, of this region for which we had good uh, prevalence data. And so informing the model at the beginning uh, from uh, a week, the first week after 
yet again other school holidays. There are several uh, school breaks in the French calendar system. This is around the month of February. Um, so we, uh, inf we, we informed the model with initial conditions that were inferred from community surveillance um, after these uh, school holidays that allowed them breaking chains of transmission at school, considering a detection rate at that moment, and then also accounting for introduction and school a separation between introduction and school transmission we used a maximum likelihood inference framework in order to estimate the transmission per contact. And what I'm showing here is really the prevalence uh, in the school, in the primary schools, the data, the points uh, correspond to the data points. Uh, uh, so the estimates from the pilot screening and here uh, in the in rows, uh, there is the, uh, the model predictions. Once we have uh, the estimate for the transmission per contact within the school, we can do it's always within the model and spreading experiment in order to estimate R um, as a function of uh, the transmission per contact. And so in that case, from the maximum likelihood estimate of the transmission per contact, we can also estimate the value of the reproductive number that is specific to each school setting in that period during the alpha wave. And what we found was an R value of 1.4 as a maximum likelihood estimate for the primary school, 1.46 for the secondary school. And here in these two plots, I'm putting in relation the estimate of R within the school with the RT that we that can be estimated from the incidence data in the community either specific to children or all ages and in both cases what we see is that this estimate of within of school specific transmission was higher than what could be estimated in the community suggesting that indeed the school participated to an increase of transmission um, and this was done in line with the, with other observations that were obtained by by several other groups around the world now these values of R are are clearly specific to this wave. They are specific to the immunity profile that the population reached at that time. Um, vaccination was campaign was already rolling out, but the percentage of, of adults vaccinated was really at the time still very limited, 10%. And these were the conditions of reactive class closure uh, with the use of mandated use of mask. That means that at each case identified from symptomatic testing, um, then the class would close, would be put in quarantine for seven days. And this has been uh, the, the protocol that has been used uh, largely in, in France uh, throughout time. Um, then based on those estimates, and this was now uh, summer 2021 when uh, Delta variant started to circulate, and so we wanted to provide information on what we could expect it could happen during the uh, fall and winter 2021 with the Delta variant uh, um, circulating. And so based on the estimate of the transmission transmissibility per contact obtained for the alpha variant, we consider the delta advantage. And so we predicted uh, the increase of the productive number for the primary school because they were not protected by vaccination. Um, one is that, for example, for secondary school, the estimate was lower than one. And this was really thanks to large vaccination coverage in adolescents, so in high school students that was reached at the start of the fall uh, 2021. Here, these specific values correspond to the coverage that was was uh, um, observed the median uh, coverage observed in Europe uh, by by mid September 2021. Um, and again, these values of R would correspond to the protocol that was still at the time implemented in France, so the reactive class closure after the detection of a case, plus the mandatory use of masks. And this for all children also in primary school. Now, the interesting thing is that having an agent-based model in which you have also variability of the contacts in terms of number and in terms of duration and in terms of also um, pairs that you, type of pairs that you establish, we can also measure the individual variability 
of the reproductive numbers of the number of secondary cases that uh, each student can generate. And what we see is that we have a large individual level variation that is compatible with the, uh, what was estimated from contact tracing data uh, in the literature. And also shows that even if the average R for the secondary school was below one, under the condition of vaccination cover, European uh, vaccination coverage, still uh, there was a non negligible probability that the individual R would be uh, larger than one, and so leading to possible chains of uh, transmission. And so under these conditions, we looked finally at different protocols. Um, and in, in particular, what we looked at was uh, the percentage of case reduction um, for a variety of protocols. So, so we looked at the reactive quarantine of the class, so that would be the light blue, that was what was implemented at the time in France. Uh, dark blue would correspond to the reactive quarantine of the grade of the student that was uh, identified as a, as a case. And this is because uh, from contact data, we found that if we look at across uh, class uh, contacts, uh, these uh, contacts are larger for the classes of the same grade because students have the same age. And of course, there are instead fewer contacts across, across classes of different grades. And so we thought that a possibility would be also to quarantine uh, not only the class of the detected case, but the grade. Then we also looked at the reactive screening of the class, which started to be something that was uh, um, discussed uh, within the government. And then all the um, different values of obtained of case reduction obtained for regular screening here we looked from left to the right to different values of adherence, 10%, um, 50%, 75%, and 100% adherence for, uh, meaning that uh, every time that regular screening was implemented in the class, uh, this would be the percentage of the school population that would adhere to the screening, and nothing would, would be happening to the rest of the class. And then we looked also at different uh, um, values of frequency, so one time every two weeks, a weekly uh, screening, and then a semi-weekly uh, screening. And what is clear is that what we found is that the quarantine was actually uh, having a, quite a large impact, about 15 to 20 percent uh, case reduction. Um, reactive screening was instead much lower, less than 10 percent. And in terms of regular screening, confirming at that time, uh, that, let's say, building evidence that was come, becoming to be available, um, that regular screening was, uh, uh, was very efficient as long as uh, uh, frequency was high. And what we also showed is that uh, instead of frequency, one could would com could compensate, for example, frequency with adhesion adherence, and so higher adherence uh, would allow also to have a weekly screening and then reduce already by thirty five percent on average the number of cases. Uh, this in terms of. Uh, case prevention. Uh, but then, of course, there is also the cost that it could be in terms of student days lost. And here again are the same uh, protocols. And what we see is that, as expected, the class quarantine that was the protocol implemented could be uh, moderately efficient in terms of reducing the cases, but on the other hand, that could be very high in, uh, um, in the cost, uh, in uh, increasing the number of student days lost to compare, for example, to symptomatic screening. Well, instead, all the other protocols, whether the reactive screening or weekly screening, uh, would have very, very small number of uh, um, absence required from the protocol. And this is clearly due to the fact that it's true that regular screening would be able to find more cases and so in principle having more people in quarantine throughout the in, in, in isolation throughout the duration of their infectious period but what happens is that this is in a very efficient way in order to break a portion of the chains of transmission and so avoid the further and ongoing transmission within the school and this is why overall the number of student days lost was kept very low we found that these resulted very very hard to communicate because it's rather countering to 
intuitive, finding more cases and then having anyway a, a smaller number of cases, which is a clear uh, impact of, uh, which is a clear effect of the uh, impact of the of the measure. We looked at how these two variables, percentage of case reduction and increase in student days lost, uh, changed with changing condition. For example, with increasing R in uh, uh, of the of the variant uh, circulation and we looked that reactive quarantine would of course still remain very costly without necessarily improving their preventive uh, um, uh, contribution uh, one instead for regular screening uh, with good adherence uh, uh, the results would align more on a vertical axis so trying to still to reduce the number of increasing days lost uh, while achieving a large case reduction. Reactive screening would be limited in both aspects. We looked at different control, uh, we, do, we looked also different screenings, for example, for the reactive screening, we looked at uh, different days after the detection of the case in which uh, to make this uh, screening of the class. We looked also at implementing control screening a few days afterwards. For example, a reactive screening one day after detection and then a control screening for days after detection. We looked at different variants, at different importation conditions, and also different vaccination coverage. I didn't I have a slide in the backup in, in as a backup in case there is a question about that for teachers and for for students and overall results were uh, maintained of course numbers changed but results the main message was maintained. Uh, Gloria, and, you have a couple of minutes. Yes. So what what I wanted to to add just very briefly is that there, there were some experimental screening conducting during the winter fall of 2021, and one of these was about uh, um, weekly screening protocol. And so what we found that these are still preliminary uh, data in terms of uh, of the comparison between observation and predictions of our model. But what we found is that the number of cases of observed cases was reduced compared to the expected number of cases that we would have given community transmission. And also this reduction was very was quite compatible with the predictions that we had made previously. And then the last part was that during the Omicron wave in January 2022, reactive screening was strengthened, meaning that at the detection of the case, the entire class had to be tested three times in the time frame of a week. And so this became very, very demanding. And now one of the opposition to the regular screening was also the use of resources that a lot of tests had to be made because of each week a, a large portion of the class should be tested and so what we uh, looked was uh, at the test demand under the high incidence conditions and uh, what we found was that um, when you have the, the incidence conditions of the Omicron wave very high as measured during January, February in 2022 in France, uh, also the demand of tests under the reactive protocol becomes very high. The number of tests per students around the peak uh, becomes close to or even possibly higher than the number of uh, uh, test per students uh, required by weekly testing. And to note that, of course, the number of students required by the weekly testing instead decreases when we approach the peak because we find cases, and so cases are put in isolation, and so we're not testing them anymore. And so this shows that given the same, quite the same uh, resources uh, under the under the peak, uh, still the peak reduction would be much higher. And here the number, uh, I'm showing the number of tests per student week on the y axis as a function of the percentage of peak reduction achieved by each protocol. In blue, there are the weekly smaller dots and semi weekly uh, larger dots. Uh, um, values and in green there is the reactive for increasing uh, uh, incidence conditions showing that as if incidence is really very high the demand in tests becomes similar but still peak reduction would be much larger under 
uh, with a regular uh, screening. So this shows again that even according in, in certain conditions, even according to the same cost in terms of testing, regular screening would, would be better. And it would be better, and this is coming, a, a feedback coming from the field, it would be better especially also for the school personnel for um, parents and also for the laboratories, because uh, they would, of course, the weekly screening is planned in time. And so it is not something that happens uh, unexpectedly and with an increasing frequency over time, in, according to the circulation of the week. And so logistically is much more manageable, both for, for the schools, for the families and also for the laboratories who need to do the implementation. And despite that, uh, anyway, the um, regular screening was never implemented in France. Um, uh, I'm just I'm sorry, close already, already with uh, thanking the people uh, that participated to the study, and in particular Elisabetta Colosi, who is the first author of many of these works, and then Julia Bassignana and Caleb Poirier, and a lot of uh, collaborators. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for your talk, Vittoria. Um, we're a bit running over time. You have a question, but because we are over time, maybe you can reply in the chat. Tristan uh, had a question. And please, uh, uh, everybody else who has questions also.